Okay, that was a naive Bayes classifier. Uh, so as we see, it's extremely easy to specify and extremely easy to learn, just uh, analytical closed form solutions, one for each uh, feature. Uh, and despite that, tends to work reasonably well in practice. Um, let's look at something that's uh, slightly less simple. We're going to look at a uh, what's called Gaussian discriminant analysis, which is really just a, a name for another type of generative model. That generative model looks like this. We have, again, y being our class, and x is our observed features. Uh, unlike in the naive Bayes case, we're going to assume that x is a vector of features and that they're not necessarily independent of one another given the class. Uh, so that is, uh, and specifically x are going to be continuous, and we're going to make the assumption that x is distributed according to a normal distribution with specific mean and covariance for each class. Uh, now, note that this is very similar to a naive Bayes model. If we put a diagonal covariance matrix here, a diagonal covariance matrix just says that the that each of our uh, features uh, in that normal distribution are independent. Uh, so a diagonal covariance matrix here is equivalent to the naive Bayes assumption. But if we don't have a diagonal covariance matrix here, then we get a uh, Gaussian discriminant analysis model, uh, which allows for some dependence among the features. To do uh, inference of our label, that is to say classification in this model, that's going to look exactly the same or very similar to the naive Bayes model. We're still going to use the same uh, Bayes rule to find our solution. And it's, it's easy to see that this decomposes to this. Our The probability of a given class we're running proportional to, to ignore the uh, denominator here, pi c, that is the prior probability of each class, that's this thing here, times the probability of x given y, which we just said is a normal distribution with parameters mu c and sigma c. That might look something like this. So here's just an example. We have two features, x1 and x2, uh, where the class I've uh, written here as the color blue, green, and red. Once we fit our Gaussian distributions, it's going to be three Gaussians because we have three classes. We might get something like this, uh, where these level sets are indicating the uh, density functions for each of the three classes. So let's look at what are the decision boundaries we would use uh, from this model. That is, where is the point uh, in this 2D space where we swap from predicting class one and switch over to class two? That's going to be, there's going to be some kind of line in the space where once we fit the model, that that classification will switch. So let's, let's look at and see what that will be. So the likelihood, or I should say the probability of a given, the posterior probability of a given class C equals the following. Uh, I've just taken the log here and written it out and put some terms that, uh, don't depend on c into this constant. Notice that this is pretty simple. We have some terms here, two terms that depend just on c, so it's going to end up being just a constant for each of the different c's. And then this term here, which is a quadratic function of x, notice that we have uh, x minus mu on the left, x minus mu on the right, and this theta c inverse in the middle. Uh, so if we wanted to explicitly write this as a quadratic function, we could uh, 
multiply it out, we would get four terms, x times x, mu times mu, and then uh, those other two. But in any case, this is, uh, this is the form of a quadratic function in x. So that is to say, our decision boundaries are going to be uh, quadratic functions. So this is going to look something like this. Uh, so here, we've drawn these curves as follows. Uh, we've defined a point in the space as red if the probability of y equals the c value, or sorry, uh, where, uh, where, where y equals the red class is greatest, uh, and then we define that point in the space as red. So you can see this whole space, any pair of features that falls into that uh, part of the space will be classified as the red label, likewise here the green label, and here the blue label. And in uh, this case, these decision boundaries will be these quadratic curves. Okay, let's look at a slightly different case. Let's look at the case where we said that each theta c are all equal to the same theta, that is, or sorry, not theta, uh, sigma. Th theta sigma c equals this single sigma, that is, use, we use the same covariance matrix for all the classes. This is often something we would want to do in practice. Uh, one issue with these types of uh, multivariate Gaussian models is that when a, especially when a class has few examples observed, the, uh, the estimate of our covariance matrix theta c can be very unstable and you can get really weird, uh, really weird effects. Uh, and the reason for that is basically that uh, having a unbound theta c essentially involves learning uh, d squared parameters, uh, where d is our number of features. And maybe we don't have that many uh, data examples. Uh, and so uh, data examples specifically for that class. Uh, and so this can be hard to learn. Uh, so this is something we might just uh, a priori want to do in practice. That is use one tied covariance matrix across all the classes that greatly reduces the number of uh, parameters we would have to learn, uh, reduces by a factor of the number of classes. So if we do that, uh, we get the following posterior uh, distribution for a given class. Um, I've simplified this a bit further. Uh, we again have this uh, term here that depends on just the class. Notice we don't even have that other term involving the covariance matrix uh, in this thing that depends on the class because the covariance matrix no longer depends on the class. So that goes into our constant. I didn't explicitly write it here, but let's write it. And then we again have this quadratic term that looks just like the thing I wrote before, but with this common covariance matrix. Uh, so just to realize something about uh, the properties of this model, the Gaussian discriminant analysis with tied covariance matrices, uh, let's write this out further. Here, I'm just expanding this quadratic function so I'm multiplying out each of these pairs, and I get the following terms, this one, this one, and that one. Notice that we have a factor of two here for this, uh, uh, this term here. That's, that's why that doesn't have the one half. Uh, now let's just rearrange this. Notice that this thing here just depends on the class. Notice that x isn't in here anywhere, just mu c and, and pi c. And this thing here depends just on the example. It has just x and nothing that depends on the class. Uh, so the only thing that depends on just the class is this term here that has x times this thing, which depends on the class, we'll call this beta c. That's just the multiplication of sigma inverse times mu c. So 
uh, we'll just name these gamma C, B C, and kappa, and write it like this. Note that uh, to be explicit, we might want to put a subscript N on this kappa, because this depends on the specific data example. Uh, so this is an expression for a posterior probability of class C. So note that this is a linear function of x. So it's just determined by x times uh, the x of the vector times some other vector beta c, which depends on mu c and sigma. Um, so if we want to know which class is more, more likely, uh, we just have to go through the different classes, compute this linear function with respect to each one, and ask which is the largest uh, value. So uh, that gives us, that lets us realize something that's interesting about this Gaussian discriminant analysis with, to with tied covariance matrix model, which is that if we're just comparing linear functions, we're going to get linear decision boundaries in our feature space. So that is to say, this generative model, this uh, the case where our label defines a multivariate normal distribution with different means but tied covariance matrix, this is a linear classification model. So in fact, we're going to find out that this is very closely related to uh, logistic regression. Uh, so we're going to talk in just a minute, uh, once we've defined logistic regression, let's compare the different methods. Um, but this approach, Gaussian discriminant analysis, is a perfectly reasonable approach. It's ap applicable to lots of different models. Anytime you have a big feature, uh, a big feature vector, you're happy to, uh, to use a Gaussian distribution to model it. As we've said, Gaussian distributions are uh, a good choice in many cases, so that's that's probably reasonable. Um, this is a perfectly good model. Uh, as I said, closely related to logistic regression, which we'll talk about in just a second. Let's look briefly at what we need to do to learn the parameters of a Gaussian discriminant analysis model. Uh, here, I've done the same thing as I did with the naive Bayes model. Uh, here, we're looking at the log likelihood of our training data. If you do that same uh, rearrangement we did for the naive Bayes model, we can see that, that, that this splits into two terms. This term involves just the categorical distribution parameters for the class. And the second term involves just the class parameters, and in fact, it decomposes into one term per class parameter. So that is to say, we can learn each of the class parameters independently. And to do that, we just take the subset of the data that corresponds to that class and use the methods we saw before to find the maximum likelihood estimate uh, for a normal distribution, or I should say a multivariate Gaussian distribution uh, on that subset of data. So uh, very easy, just like it was for a naive Bayes model uh, analytical solution that we've uh, seen in the past.